Well, uh, we have about an hour and a half, I think, <coughs> and I won't take up too much time to introduce Amardeep Singh and the beautifully written book, Lost Heritage, The Sick Legacy in Pakistan. Just a word about our speaker today. He was born in Gorakhpur in India and has lived in Hong Kong <coughs> and Singapore. In his academic career, he has combined engineering and business administration. Now that's a great combination. Uh, a lot of people from our part of the world have done that, and they have done extremely well in terms of economic rewards, but you have done very well in terms of <laughs> Thank <laughs> literary. <you. laughs> Thank you. So while working in the corporate sector, he has uh, pursued uh, literary and creative uh, arts. He comes to us at the Institute at an interesting time. In fact, he and I and uh, two other people or three other people were at a, uh, <coughs> at a TV station the other day where we talked about 70 years of uh, India and Pakistan as independent states. And uh, he made some very interesting comments. But there were a couple, uh, couple of foreigners and it was very interesting for me how little they understand <laughs> about our part of the world, and I hope uh, this kind of work uh, will uh, help <coughs> help understanding where South Asia is, where India and Pakistan are, and so on. While I haven't read all that Amadeep Singh has written, I was able to get hold of the book rather late, uh, and absorbed all the pictures in, in the book, and he tells me He's taken them all, other than a few black and white pictures. I was struck by one episode he relates. Some of the disciples of Bulle Shah, the Punjabi mystic poet who did his work in the first part of the 18th century, were beaten by some observant Muslims for not fasting during the month of Ramadan. They complained to the poet uh, as to why being his disciples, uh, uh, they were beaten. Uh, so Bulesha asked them, what did they ask you and what did you say? Uh, and they said, we just said that we are Muslims and they sat upon us. So Bulesha said, that's why you were beaten. Because I recommend because you identified yourself. You uh, identified yourself with a religion, with uh, a group of people. I remain nothing, and they could not do anything to me. I am just a part of God. I thought that was a very interesting. Uh, uh, I also learned, I didn't know this, uh, reading uh, not all of your book, but some parts of it, that there is a kind of correspondence between Sikhism and Sufism, uh, that association of uh, feminine attributes with God, am I right? No, and masculine. Fe feminine with the human uh, and yes. masculine with the so God. That's, uh, it's a union that we're looking did for. Did you know that, Professor Sa I mean, the Ambassador Sa uh, No, but I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> so with that brief introduction, let me turn over to Amadeep Singh. One thing we are going to do is, uh, once he has spoken, and there will be question and answer session, uh, his preference is uh, that he would like to answer each question when it is asked, rather than a cluster. So that's what we will do. So over to thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir, Mr. Varkiji. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to thank uh, ISAS for creating this platform to, for me to come here and, and share my journey and my findings uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, His Excellency Mr. Nasrullah Khanji for being here with us. Uh, this work would not have been possible, I say this time and again, without the common men, the people of Pakistan, who embraced me, embraced my quest. And uh, that was the first book. Uh, what you see on the picture up there is, uh, on the screen up there, is that there's a second book which is coming out.
uh, it should be out in another one and a half months' time, which is a similar format, which is called, this is called the Lost Heritage of Sikh Legacy in Pakistan. That's called The Quest Continues for Lost Heritage of Sikh Legacy in Pakistan. So it's a 500-page book. That's another 500-page book. But the 500-page book that follows, I would like to thank the Pakistan government and sir, to you, because if not for you, I wouldn't have been there. <laughs> so we know that he knows the details, but uh, I really appreciate what uh, the government did and embraced me, uh, because I've been able to get into places which I could have never imagined, probably because the uh, conflicts that exist across both sides of the border, and also especially as a Sikh, you get identified, and probably your loyalties are assumed to be on one side versus the fact that you have no loyalties to anyone. <laughs> but mankind, right? So um, uh, you, do, you do get questioned, but, uh, but it was the Pakistan government that openly embraced me. So thank you, sir. Um, I want to actually, the way I want to structure this presenta presentation is I want to, it's a socio-cultural uh, uh, impact of partition, right? But I want to actually share my personal reflections. So it's going to be a very visual intensive journey. Right, so, uh, and, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that emerge from it. But I first want to give you my background, why I went on this path. And then, as a com composite of both the journeys, I have traveled to 126 cities and villages. And what I have observed from the Sikh legacy point of view, I want to share that. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so, so this is the 70th, uh, seven decades of par partition, the 71st year. Uh, and, and I did post the other day on the 14th and 15th of August on my Facebook, my, my personal thoughts of looking at the various forms of joys and, and there's, there's a place for that. You know, I'm, I'm not questioning that. People are, have all the rights to, to be happy of, of the own nations, right? As the flags unfurled, for me, it has always been a moment of, of reflection, a moment of sadness when humanity suffered, right? We have in this, uh, flurry of activities forgotten that what went through the people on both sides of the border, right? It is not about Hindus and Sikhs on one side and Muslims on the other side. The fact remains that the Jains also suffered, suffered the Parsis suffered, atheists also suffered, the who had no belief in any god also suffered, right? So it's a composite uh, suffering that has made me dwell into this realm, uh, I, having been born as a Sikh, uh, of course, every person is, is, uh, grows up with a certain amount of conditioning, have grown up with a certain amount of conditioning, I don't deny that. But I've tried to leave that conditioning, I've tried to embrace humanity, I have actually tried to look at the subject from my community's lens, but I believe you, believe you in me, my findings apply to every community. It is not about the Sikh legacy. It is about what happened to humanity. And you can choose to see it from this lens. That's just part of it. Right. Uh, and before I, I move forward, I just want to say, read out a couplet which is in Punjabi, uh, and I'll translate it. It basically says, Lali akhiyan di pe das di hain, roye tusi bhi ho, te roye asi bhi hain. The redness in my eyes, because the tears, uh, reflect that both you and I have cried. Right, so we, with that, I want to start off. So see this as a, as a humanities, uh, uh, a quest to understand the human perspective, right? Um, as the play ended in 1947 and dispersed the people across both sides of the borders, um, my first book was reviewed. I was very glad that it was reviewed by, by a Muslim. Uh, because I wanted to actually maintain this diverse perspective. So I asked Professor Ishtiaq Ahmadji to, to look at my book and write a blurb for it. Uh, tell me if I'm going wrong anyway. And, 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 and I was very glad that a Muslim reviewed it. And what he said out here was, I just want to actually talk, read about the highlight, highlighted portion. Uniquely, it captures the distinctive Sikh contribution to the spiritual, social, cultural, and architectural history of present-day Pakistan over which a curtain was drawn. It was truly a play that ended in 1947. Because the entire community dispersed. The second book, again, I have maintained the same principle. I've got one, 
I've got one Indian, one Pakistani to review it for the blurb, and I've got one Singaporean to review it for the blurb. But what I want to actually read out of a man who was impacted by partition, and he's, he's a big man in Bollywood right now, Gulzar Ji. Uh, Gulzar is a, is a poet. He writes, um, he's written many songs, but he does sh Shero Shairi. And what he reflected, because he was from the uh, a village called uh, Dinga near Jhelum in Pakistan, and now he's in Bombay. So what he did was, when he read this, he called me up. He says, Amadeep, I, I am, I'm very emotional. Uh, is it OK if I can write a couplet in, in Urdu? I said, by all means, I will publish it in Urdu. I'll print it on my back of my cover in, in Urdu. But we will translate it too. So while those who cannot read the Urdu, this is what he's written in my second book. It's coming out. But the couplet that he read was, uh, I'll read it out in Urdu, and then we'll, we'll get down to, to the translation. He says, Kahan se ibtida ki thi? My Urdu is not that great, but uh, still I'll get through. Main kahin bhool na jaun. Janoo mein lot ke main nakshe kadam dhoon raha hoon. Uh, what it means is, where did it begin from? I do not wish to forget. In frenzy do I return in search of those footprints. So these are the emotions that is invoking amongst the people. And that's, that's to me, is, is the essence of the work. I've always reflected what seeks a collateral damage in the, in the events of partition. Because again and again, I've heard the two sides. And you know, again, don't feel this that I'm risking it down only the Sikh lens. The fact is applies to everyone, but I'm trying to study it from that angle. But the two nation theory that we talk about and we debate about and we go tugs of war left, right, for seven decades we've been doing that. And I, and I reflect on it and say, where do we fit into this two nation theory? <laughs> Were we a collateral damage? Where do the other communities fit? And the fact is, I don't have an answer to this. It's just my mere reflection. Because time's gone by, and, and I don't think I can correct anything, but I can reflect on it. And to me, it looks like uh, no one thought about us. And when they didn't think about us, they didn't think about many other communities. And seven decades later, <clears throat> the su subject is sociocultural impact of partition. The biggest answer is to this question in terms of sociocultural impact is, I was a banker. I'm an accidental officer. Uh, engineering and, and, and uh, MBA did not teach me emotions. Uh, my, my foray into, into, into the subject of Pakistan and, and the events of partition, I think, made me more humane. So, so when I actually look back, and you know, for years I've been delving into the history of the region, uh, <clears throat> reading spirituality, trying to cut across Sufism, Sikhism, uh, Hinduism, a lot of thoughts there and here. Um, but I would go back to my community and ask the youth uh, many a times that, look, if you had a free access to go to Pakistan, where would you like to go? Now, this is seven decades later. And the answer, invariably, would be just the following. It would start with, oh, I would like to go and see Nankana Sahib. Nankana Sahib, where is the founder of, Guru, of the Sikh faith, Guru Nanak, was born. Sikh faith was founded. Uh, are on the soils of, uh, of Pakistan, uh, they would say we would like to go and see Baba Nanak's place. Some would say we would like to go to another shrine which is maintained in Pakistan, which is called Panja Sahib. Some would go as far as saying Dera Sahib, but you know, answers are limited to the religious domain. And then some would go as far as saying that, oh, we would like to go and see our father's and mother's place. And then I would say, and where else? And they go blank. And to me, that's where lies the answer that our minds have been conditioned seven decades after partition, that we cannot think more than religion and our personal quest, my mother and father and the religion. Sorry, but before I give an answer and my perspective on that, uh, I just want to give a bit of a context here. You've got two maps there. On your left is the map uh, <clears throat> pre pre-1849, the green section inside that, the pre-1849, before British came into the Punjab. Punjab was the last standing state in the conquest of India, uh, and it gave the stiffest resistance. Um, 
whatever we might brand people in terms of religion and so on and so forth, the fact remains in the history of Punjab, the only time Punjabis came together was under Ranjit Singh. And his was a very, very secular rule, uh, which brought together Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs inside the cabinet and the military. Ranjit Singh's less known fact and less known talked about thing is that Ranjit Singh's army was more than 50% Muslims. So how can it be a, 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 you know, a, a religion-based based kingdom? It, I, I call it a very secular kingdom where all participated. His cabinet ministry had, his foreign minister was a Muslim, but these things are not talked about these days. But what I'm trying to show there is the green portion is where the Sikh kingdom I don't call it a Sikh kingdom. If given a choice, I would call it as a Punjabi kingdom. But the history has called it as a Sikh kingdom because British wrote the history. And British always had a flavor of seeing Ranjit Singh as, you know, they do the divide and rule kind of a thing. So, but they saw Ranjit Singh as Sikh, so they called it a Sikh kingdom. But the fact is it was a Punjabi kingdom. And that was the kingdom, the green one. And then on the second map, what I've done is I've overlaid what became after 1947. And so I've turned the yellow section, which was the Sorry, the Sikh kingdom is the yellow section, my, my fault. What on, the, on your left-hand side is where, where India and Pakistan are today. And on the Indian Pakistan, on the right-hand side, I've overlaid the yellow section as what the Sikh kingdom was and where it falls. What comes out is, clearly, is 20% 20, 20 of that kingdom today is in, is in India, and 80% of that is in Pakistan. Right? Now go back to that question which I was saying. If you had to, an option to go to Pakistan, what would you see? And let's try and answer that question. Legacies are bigger than religion. Religion is a facet of, of, of a legacy. When I went to Mansera and I was taken by a descendant of one of our distant relatives who chose to stay back and adopted Islam, uh, and uh, he took me to the grave of his father, and on it, when I read it, the answer of this question lies in there. It says, Gulam Sarwar Vald Makhan Singh. Gulam Sarwar is his, his adopted Muslim name, which has changed his identity after 1947, but he's the son of Makhan Singh, and Singhs are all primarily Sikhs, right? So to me, here lies the answer on this grave. We have buried our past, and in this grave lies a man who, for whatever reason, I don't question his reasons. Personal motivation, positive, negative, that's his personal reason. He stayed back. But the fact remains, his legacy today, I mean, is, is not known to people, right? And such are the stories that we actually reflect back in my community. My community itself has killed its total understanding of what an empire it was, what were the footprints, were my forefathers so incompetent that they just made three gurdwaras, the three temples that are presently being talked about? Surely not. And as I delved into the histories pages for years, to me it had been dawning that the, the, the presence was much more bigger. Our saints were common, our friends were common, our languages were common, but somewhere down the line we are all divided. And therefore, when after 25 years in the corporate world, I personally decided to not take a change which was going to take me to Australia, and I thought it was important for me to be in Singapore, where my kids were in, in school. So as I stepped out, I didn't know my life was going to change so dramatically because of Pakistan. But uh, I just decided I wanted to go to Pakistan to see my father's place. And my quest was not a, a quest to write a book. I'm not a person from academics. I'm an accidental author, right? So I, I went into Muzaffarabad which is in Kashmir, where the problem of Kashmir started, right? Uh, in fact, we were speaking on the television and the, the, the anchor actually raised a question about Kashmir. And my answer was, where does the other communities fit into this equation? As we debate about Kashmir between the Hindus and Muslims and so on and so forth, where do the pundits fit? Where do the Sikhs fit into this debate? We don't know, right? So. My father was from Muzaffarabad. Muzaffarabad had a very large Sikh population, very large. And it was a historical point where the Sikhs, the guru of the Sikhs actually had gone into Kashmir from Wazirabad he had come in, in Pakistan, and gone through this route into, into Kashmir Valley, which is in India's side now. Uh, I wanted to go to that, that bridge which you see on your right hand side and just 
hold the soil because there was a big massacre that happened here on 21st October 1947 when the problem of Kashmir started and uh, a lot of people from our family were 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 the victims in that because there were 300 of them were Sikhs were put on the bridge on either side they were fired and a um, lot of our personal people uh, suffered in that so in our family and I had grown up hearing those stories so I just wanted to go there as a as a debt to my father and uh, and my mother I just want to pick up the soil from there and bring it back but I went there I didn't feel like picking up the soil I left it and I came back because to me it was a chapter that was closed I was just trying to feel it but you know this was just a a small reason what happened was thereafter was the works that I'm talking about the two works because as I went into into Pakistan the people met up with me and the people embraced me and that's the beauty of my journey because there was no Hindu, Sikh or Muslim there at the ground level. It was humanity. And in 30 days that I went about, without any support, without any, any, any uh, you know, security or anything, you know, as people may perceive today that you know, going into Pakistan is a danger, I just traveled freely you know, and people embraced me. And what you see on your uh, left hand side um, is the dots where I traveled. Um, I went to 36 places in 30 days. That was the start of the journey. And I came back and I looked at my repository of pictures and I said to myself, wow, this is like a huge amount of stuff that I've seen and it's just not traveling. Wherever I would go, some divine intervention was throwing up places that I was reading in the history uh, in terms of remnants, in terms of monuments. And I, I, and I was just being shown that. Some power was showing me. And I thought, you know what, it will be so criminal on my end if I was not to go back and document this for posterity. It's so easy to go back to the corporate world and if you go and actually document this, leave it for the next few generations, which is not a work which has not been done for seven decades, I, I, I need to do that. So I didn't go back to the corporate world. But thereafter, uh, as I was saying in January, thanks to Mr. Nasrullah Khanji and, uh, and the Pakistan government, I don't know what energies embraced me once again. And I, in January and February, I went go to the map that you see next, on the next side, on, on, the, on your right hand side. It took me to 126 cities and villages, sorry, 90 cities and villages across Pakistan once again. And this time it was all the five states from Balochistan, Sindh, uh, Khyber, uh, Punjab, and as well as Kashmir. In totality, I've traveled to 126 cities and villages. And therefore, with that background, I just want to actually talk a little bit about what I've seen, what I've observed, what are my uh, reflections on the socio-cultural aspect. But you know what, when I came back, I found there are, so thanks to Pakistan government, um, presently, so at the time of partition, there was only one Sikh temple which was left operational, which was Nankana Sai, which is where Guru Nanak was born. Uh, <clears throat> today, seven decades after, there are about 23 historical Gurdwaras that are operational. So I, I do thank the Pakistan government, and I always say this, the willingness is there. But the problem is so big that the entire communities have left their heritage and gone. So, so the issue has to be cannot be grappled with it. It's, it's a huge problem. And I'm just look, talking about the Sikhs. You know, if you look at, start looking at the Hindu and the Jain uh, presence, you know, that becomes a bigger problem. And at the same time, when you cross the border and you go, the Muslims in Punjab also suffered the same, right? Um, Punjab was ethnically cleansed on both the sides. Hey, Muslims were cleansed on the, on the east and Hindus and Sikhs were cleansed on the west. The, the, the Islamic heritage suffers in the same manner on the east side. So the problem is, is much bigger than what we can comprehend. But on the other side, I found a lot of vestiges, what you see as the second picture. Uh, and to me, both these aspects I tried to document in this book. But my key catalyst of this, this was when I went to you know, Atak Fort, uh, where Ranjit Singh took this over from the Afghans. I had. I'm showing you a black and white picture. This is a picture from Alexander Burns' travelogue, which he came in 1831 to the Punjab. Because there was, in, 1830, in the early 1800s, there was a great game which was ongoing in Europe for the tussle of uh, India. You know, and, and, the, and the British in India had come by sea and they were looking at, uh, you know, will, uh, will we be in threat if, if we lose against Napoleon? or if the Tsars join hands with Napoleon and they come through Punjab and Ranjit Singh opens the gateway to, to India, then that's the end of the empire in India for the British. So they had started spending spies into the, into the uh, Punjab. And Alexander Burns brought in 
five horses to gift to to uh, ranjit singh in lahore but he came by ship and he went up the river indus from sindh and he came to attack and this is the place where he sketches it where he docked his his uh, ship and i looked at at attack where i was standing it was similar and I'm, i said is this a divine intervention that i've been brought to the same place and i'm standing and i'm 25 years back i read this travel log and that's where i it, it i felt that you know what the british clearly knew how to document the history we as people from the indian subcontinent are very poor in doing that and in those days the the uh, cameras did not exist and here are some of the sketches that we have and we have now cameras and i'm actually traveling and i'm clicking so many photographs so to me it was that you know we've got to document this for the future and if the british could do it in the words i can do it with visuals because today the fact remains the people don't want to read just text people want a visual anchoring to the text to be able to motiv get motivated to get into the essence of the subject and therefore i decided i need to write this with that i'm bringing you the social cult social culture observations in a few slides um as a composite of my both of my works right uh as i said earlier punjab was cleansed on both the sides right and there's no no ifs and doubts about that uh amritsar was a 50% muslim city today you barely find the muslims that you find there are the migrants who are coming in from other parts of india Uh, because of economic reasons they are living perfectly well in india right now in amritsar but in 1947 it became 100% hindu and sikh city and so so also lahore which had a significant sikh and hindu population overnight as twin cities became a islamic city right so here's a problem right big problem now when i now the perception however interestingly around the world is that pakistan is predominantly uh, pakistan is is where minorities are not able to survive that's the perception uh you know what i always say this problems exist in every country uh terrorists exist in every country you know issues exist in every country where it, be it us uk india pakistan it exists everywhere even nepal right the fact is what people don't know is that yes there was a problem in 1947 thereafter many communities are still surviving in pakistan right uh, i don't know the exact number but i think uh, my sense is it must be about 5 to 6 million sir if i think so in, in terms of uh, minorities right so there is a significant there is a there is a sizable population which is there um from a seek legacy perspective what i've done in this map is i've i've shaded a few areas uh <clears throat> what you find in that in that uh, reddish kind of a color is an area which was cleansed as an outcome of partition and i i'm not showing the cleansing that happened in india so don't it's just a part of the story i'm telling you because cleansing also happened there but my subject is pakistan right so cleansing happened in this uh, reddish area there is a small pocket between that area of the reddish which you see tucked inside a green and a, and a bluish uh, this is the frontier area close to afghanistan border where interestingly hindus in that green belt Uh, so six uh, pashtun sikhs in that green belt are still surviving there's a com community of about 12000 to 13000 sikhs turban wearing beard keeping sikhs who are living perfectly fine in that area yes they did face problem and 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 over the years they have they have regained their this their respect in the society and they're doing very well and they are surviving there so there's one pocket of of sikhs living there what you find tucked in there also inside that red circle is the blue portion and then if you come down south the the blue portion that i've drawn in sindh and balochistan it actually reflects an interesting confluence of belief systems and this is what i call as nanak panthis panth in the in the indian word basically means a community a community who are the believers of nanak so believers of nanak for whatever reason so in 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 today's india we might because a sikh is so so boxed to as a definition of being defined as a man with a turban and a beard in terms of a perception but if you go back in history nanak actually transcended a lot of societies right uh, there were muslims who also respected him hindus equally respected him and and a lot of practices of hindus who were aligned along the indus belt to the nanak's belief system 
are not the same as the gangetic bent hinduism hinduism where the punjabi hindus got dispersed into because when they came on this side they dispersed they got dispersed into a place where the caste system was more prevalent the the uh, the uh, uh, multitudes of gods and goddesses were more more prevalent but the belief system along the indus belt was that of uh, more and in terms of hindu philosophy if i have to say as advait hinduism non duality hinduism that means god is one which is similar to sufism which is similar to nanak's belief system and this is the belt where a lot of those those nanak panthis are still surviving i have had a chance to actually meet and interact with them right uh it's interesting i and this we have limited time so i can't get into depth of that but i've coming in my second book my perceptions but it's interesting how when a conflict happened and the dispersion happened how the belief systems changed in in of amongst the communities as they landed in the new geographies and how the ones who were tucked away and left in that land where they lost their contact with the broader uh groups of people how their belief systems have remained intact as pre 1947 It's interesting when I've gone into these people, whom now in India, if you look at them, and we will simply say he's a Hindu, but these people will themselves say they they appear to be Hindu, but they will proudly say in my conversations with them, we are we are Sikhs, and you know here's here's a dilemma you got in terms of their practices and belief systems that they are perceived by the world as Hindus, but they are themselves calling themselves as Sikhs, but they don't look and 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 see to be Sikhs, right? so this is a an interesting socio cultural uh, ap- impact after a partition so i'm touching a little bit on philosophy cultural language and heritage from a philosophy perspective our saints were divided in in partition the line the ratcliffe line has has been so criminal in our philosophical mindset that a sikh today has forgotten the closeness in terms of poetry in the terms of our our i remember my parents used to so fondly talk about baba bulle shah uh, baba farid sai mia mir and the, so many other uh, my father used to read urdu as a language at the same time uh, nanak is forgotten in pakistan amongst the muslims i mean i got a facebook message from one person in 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 lahore he just has written a, a book on nanak um, the founder of sikh faith and he's he's writing to me he says the awareness is so little out here that uh, i struggle that my book will is not reaching the people uh, about this common heritage and he's sending me a book from there but when i look at these thing i say you know our saints are divided that's the biggest social cultural impact from a philosophical point of view and if when once philosophies get divided then the mind will just keep dividing further and further philosophy is the only thing that unites humanity and if we can't accept our, our common philosophical uh, unity then i don't know where this road will lead us to as i stood at ganda singh wala border uh, near kasur where baba bulle shah's place is and i looked on the other side and here's the border it says in urdu he says delhi is 360 kilometers and firozpur is 9 kilometers and i am looking at myself and says firozpur is bare uh, baba farid's big uh, mazar is there and i'm saying here the people would like to go to the mazar 9 kilometers from here and the people across would like to just come 9 kilometers on this end go to kasur to baba bulle shah's place but we can't to me it feels like the punjabis have left their trousers in pakistan and the shirt in in india that's the that's the that's the unfortunate aspect of this uh as i've gone around in different places i'll show you from the feelings that i've had from various places i've been to in jhelum on your left hand side you see a picture of a of a board um in one of the dilapidated gurdwaras which is lying there unattended for seven decades no service has happened for seven decades but what's written in gurmukhi on top is we have a daily morning service in every gurdwara which is called as asa diwar it's a morning rendition and it's it it's written asa diwar the samay the, the timing for asa diwar right and it that's what is standing there and i'm looking at them saying seven decades it's been standing there waiting for the next service to happen and you go into the next place or there and this is a a a a large congregation hall the granth sahib this holy holy scripture of sikhs would be kept on this platform and the people would sit there and these are lying absolute silently i mean you drop a stone inside and it 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 echoes and it just goes on and on right so that's the that's the unfortunate outcome of the partition that we are looking at from a philosophy point of view 
and then to end this philosophical section at Dera Sahib Gurdwara in Lahore, and I say this time and again, sir, both of you are people of influence, and I, and I request to you that if you can have any influence at any point of time, please open the doors of the Gurdwaras in Punjab, in Pakistan, which are functional historical Gurdwaras, to our Muslim brothers and sisters too. Because when I go there, um, at, the, at the entrance, the security man, of course, for whatever reason, they say this was security reason, but I say security can be enhanced. But don't stop people from coming inside. And he says, and my friends have gone with me, and, and Muslim friends, and they have been asked not to go inside because their faith happens to be Muslim. Uh, and this is the security people, not the Sikh security people. It's the, it's the government appointed security people who are, who are saying, if you're a Muslim, you can't go inside. That's against the principle of the Sikh faith. Sikh faith does not stop anyone from coming inside. And though there are, interestingly, at this Dera Sahib Gurdwara in Lahore, there is one family of Muslim which comes there to still sing the hymns of Guru Nanak because their ancestors, their forefather, Guru Nanak's best friend was Bhai Mardana. He was a Muslim. He, Gurdwara, uh, Guru Nanak, I, I joke, you know, he, he was, uh, he was, he was st struck by a travel bug. I mean, he was just traveling all over the world. And the man who traveled with him was Bhai Mardana, a Muslim, all the time. Right? And his descendants today still come to this place to sing the renditions of Guru Nanak. And in this place I reached, and there was once, if you see at the, at the, at the scripture, the Sikh sitting there, and the three people who are singing, one, two of them happen to be the Sindhi uh, Hindus, the Nanak Panthis, as I would call them, and one of them who's, who's sitting and playing the tabla, he's a Muslim and a descendant of, of Bhai Mardana. Right? And I'm looking there, I said, this is what we were supposed to be. That we could sit together and we could actually uh, come together. But the unfortunate thing is, and I will give a slap to my community on this, is that after partition, pre-partition, there were certain families of Muslims who could perform uh, singing of hymns in the Golden Temple at Amritsar. Unfortunately, the divide has become so such a big problem that today um, the the management community committees of of the Golden Temple in Amritsar would not permit a Muslim to sing inside the Sanctum Sanctorum. It's a problem on both the sides. Culturally, I say this. This is at a, I'm at a memorial at near near Naushera where a, a battle of uh, Noshera happened uh, where Akali Fula Singh died in, in 1830s. Um, and <coughs> what we've forgotten is that Ranjit Singh's army had a lot of foreign European generals inside it. He had something like 55 generals from various parts, Americans, uh, Europeans, British, as well as French, and, in, and a Russian also in his army. But interestingly, there was a small community of Gurkhas which are part of his soldiers. The leader of the Gurkhas, Bal Bhadra Kumar, along with Akali Fula Singh, a Sikh, and along with his, the Muslim soldiers also, they died at this place. And there was a memorial that was built here, and that's finished. And this is the Kabul River floating next to it. And I went there, and I made it a point to go and put my hand inside the river, because I feel, you know, the stories that we write, the poetries that we write, the proses that we write, uh, are influenced heavily by the environment. The Punjabis, my, my forefather, my, my parents, the, 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 the poetry of theirs was from this land. The star-crossed lovers of Heer Ranja, Sasi Punnu, Soni Mahiwal, these are all from the land of the five rivers. And in Gangetic Belt, people don't know these stories. And my, my Sikh community's next generation is not able to connect to these stories because the environment is not there with them. And I understand why you can't connect with these stories, because you can't feel the water of that, that river where these stories happened. You can't feel the soil of that place where these stories happened. That's the pain in terms of what we've lost in terms of our, our cultural aspects. I say this time and again. Uh, the problem is such a big problem. I don't point fingers. You know, Every time you point a finger, three point back to you, right? Remember that. So, so this is not about India and Pakistan. This is about a problem that happened. Sikhs left and Sikhs went. Uh, of course, now who's going to take care of the heritage? And heritage is taken as old to own tolls. And in the various villages, I found these beautiful frescoes, garbage dumps, and so on and so forth lying there. But I would turn around and say, we, the Sikhs, have destroyed it ourselves in the East Punjab. Because as the Sikhs moved aside, the heritage does not exist in East Punjab anymore. 
such beautiful heritage also existed there once in east punjab in india but we went there and because we lost everything now this was a mad rush from a human psychology point of view to prove yourself and when you lose everything you want to prove yourself that you are good and you are better and therefore you went and destroyed your heritage in india you plastered them with marble you plastered them with gold and everything you don't find such beautiful frescoes that are still lying in pakistan though in pakistan unfortunately the community is not there to take care of them in india we've lost it all because we've destroyed it ourselves we've committed suicide ourselves that's the unfortunate socio cultural impact to the community on both sides of the border from a language perspective uh, i'm just going to take probably 5 7 more minutes out here from a language perspective suffering is uh, on on both the sides from a language perspective right uh i it's a it's a long topic but the bottom line in the undivided punjab there were multiple scripts there was gurmukhi there was shahmukhi uh pre pre british occupation there was persian as the official language and then it became the urdu but punjabi remained as the as the spoken language irrespective of whatever script you write in one of the things that i see as i would i noticed was in places like hazro and all i went to these hindu temples right which are lying scattered and uh, lying uh, abandoned and inside on the on the floors i'm looking at the at the at the at the script that's written there and this is the gurmukhi script which is which is in which the hindus and sikhs of punjab would once write but the again another socio cultural aspect is that with the dispersion of the population into the indian gangetic belt what's happened is the sikhs themselves are trying to hold on to the gurmukhi because the script happens to be written in the gurmukhi language and if they lose the ability to read gurmukhi they've lost the ability to delve into the into the uh, into the depths of the philosophy of their scripture right but the hindu community apart from the east punjab which went into the up and bihar maharashtra and other places they have forgotten gurmukhi and when i'm going into these temples i'm saying gurmukhi and you have a proof there was a language which was common across us all right the hindu and sikh community so this is again and then my father was well versed with urdu and all the sikhs and hindus of that region would also read and write urdu but now urdu is a islamic language so we will not read it either right i having come back sir after uh, having come back from pakistan i must say so that i've been so impacted that that in the last 3 months i've learned how to read and write urdu so so i i reclaim my heritage i reclaim my heritage because uh, my father used to know it so it's it's not religious right uh again this is a small thing here when you're looking from a heritage point of view on one side there are maintained aspects of the heritage uh that's ranjit singh's uh, memorial in lahore but then at the other side uh where i'm walking up that huge mount of rubble i'm i'm inside the fort of jamrod which is under pakistan army right now and i was very fortunate that pakistan army took me inside um uh, and and i was able to photograph it from inside um but but this is a place where one of the bravest generals of of the punjab hari singh nalwa died here uh in the expansion of the empire towards westward side right and and today it's in rubble so so it's a big issue on both the sides right in terms of one place there is things that are maintained but majority of the things are now all finished forgotten right uh to me this was a very symbolic picture i clicked um of looking at the punjab sahib gurdwara from the grills of a window of a of a window and to me it signified though i'm there but not there as yet because to access my own places of worship my own community's places of worship the visa regimes are so tight i was very fortunate it was a divine intervention that got me across the border so smoothly but another seek wanting to go to places like these is struggling the hindu community is struggling the muslims on the other side are struggling to get to ajmer sharif on this side the visa regimes are so tight because of the political environment that humanity is suffering and to me it this symbolically represented that we are we are our whole entire existence has been been caged right and uh, in terms of the abandoned gurdwaras one of the other problem that happened from socio cultural aspect is when the population swapped you know when a when a when a migration happened of 10 million people 1 million died and 10 million people moved on both the sides uh, a lot of people went inside uh, gurdwaras temples um, halls of the communities on both the sides right uh, mosques in east punjab suffered similarly as has happened in the west side where you find people from up and bihar seven decades later this is a gurdwara which is their home now right 
uh, I've been very fortunate that everyone that I've gone and actually requested have allowed me to come inside. I see this as their property now, but humanly, from a human perspective, they've all allowed me to, to come inside and see. But it's the pain that I see on both the sides. You see the floors, you see still the, 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 the tiles on the floor, and, and it's, it's, it's occupied on both the sides. Right? So that's, that's the other issue. Um, communities stand divided, and I look at the, the uh, names of the villages, to me at an emotional level, it, it represents a lot. There is the Ratcliffe line dividing, um, very close to Lahore, dividing India and Pakistan. And on one side is the Twin City. These are the Twin Cities. People used to say that, you know, in the earlier days, oh, there used to be the rich ones who would have their breakfast in, in, in Amritsar and go and have dinner in Lahore and come back. But there's a line which divides the two cities now. And on this side, in Pakistan side, I'm standing at the village called Killa Jeevan Singh, which is named after a Sikh. And on the, just on the other side, if you see in the Google map, is the, is the, is the village which is named after a Muslim, Sarai Amanat Khan. It's the is the unfortunate again you know consequences of Pakistan of the of the creation of Pakistan and India that even the cities uh, you know which had a commonalities here stand divided and and we can't claim them. Coming to an end, as I said earlier, communities are existing. Though yes, they've been dispersed. Problems are there on both the sides of the border. We can't ignore it. Problems are there, um, but it doesn't mean that communities are not existing. And as I look at Here's a doctor who helped me in, in Lahore. He's a Pashtun Sikh. He's Dr. Mimpal Singh. Uh, he's he's uh, a child specialist uh, in Lahore. Uh, that's another person working in a hospital. All I want to say is that people are also living. So it's not as bad as people perceive, though yes, they're minorities. And minorities anywhere will suffer. Minorities will suffer anywhere, whether it be the blacks in USA or whether it be the the, the, uh, in India, the other minorities, or in Pakistan. That's a problem of the humanity, right? So we've got to rise above these things. Um, in Sindh, I want to give you a flavor. Uh, we talk, I earlier talked about one Gurdwara was there at the time of 1947, and now today 23 Gurdwaras are operational. These are historical point of view, right? These are historical Gurdwaras. But as you go into Sindh and Balochistan, you'll be wonderstruck. The amount of community Gurdwaras that are, are mushrooming there, I, I believe you me, I mean, I was, I was wonderstruck. Here's a Gurdwara which has just opened up 10 years back at uh, Baba Thariya Singh Gurdwara. Uh, and he's the pivotal force, the man there. He's a Sindhi Sikh. And at Balochistan, you see in that community, uh, in the congregation hall, they're all singing the Sikh verses in the end of the day uh, when I went there. There's only one man with a turban who's standing up there, but the rest is all the Nanak Panthi community sitting there, and they're all... Uh, singing verses. So people are surviving. Let's not paint a, such a bad picture, but there is a problem, but there is, people are surviving. And in ending, I would say, a lot of people have asked me uh, many times, and especially the Pakistan people, the first reaction comes in is, sir, uh, why have you called this as lost heritage, right? And I always say that, please see this from my point of view. If I don't have an access to my own places where my history was crafted, it is lost. So let's rise above why this and why that and accept history cannot be changed. History has, has happened, it's been formed, but emotionally I have all the right to emote and, and to claim, at least in the form of a book, what belongs to me and to my community. And as I stood at the remains of a Gurdwara in, um, uh, close to Jhelum in a village called Ker Bawa, I found this, an apt writing uh, on, on, the, on the walls written by someone else on charcoal, in charcoal. And I hate when people destroy heritage, be it anywhere, right? In the Indian subcontinent, it's a, it's a big problem. Bangladesh, India, and, Singh, and, and Pakistan, people will just destroy all forms of heritage, right? We have this in our DNA, right? Just to write our names. <laughs> Claim with our love signs, you know, as though someone's bothered about your love sign on the heritage, right? But here's something that I'm glad someone wrote. <laughs> because it said, I lost my everything. And to me, that was the emotion that I, I left with. And, and I looked at this another place in Gandia, uh, this, this falling remains of a Gurdwara, which was a village Gurdwara, a small Gurdwara. It's resting on one leg. If you see it, it's tilting. It's resting on one leg. It's about to fall apart, right? And as I've gone around, last two slides, as I've gone around and looked at people, I'm standing, this picture was clicked while I was standing on the top of the first floor of a Gurdwara in Punjab, and I'm looking down, 
I was definitely a Bollywood star because I'm standing and I know people are all there and looking at me and the entire village has come around because they've never seen a Sikh before. <laughs> they've never seen a Sikh in a land where Sikhs crafted the history. Irony of the whole thing, right? And I'm waving at them and they all are looking up there and wow, man, it was Sadarji, Sadarji, and you know. So I'm, a, I'm okay, all right, I'm, I'm a star here, right? So, and then as I'm leaving, I just want to leave with this. Let's rise above our divisions. Every place, you see that man, he's about 80 years. He sees me in the village in Basali, he gives me, comes to me, gives me a hug. He says, in Punjabi, I'll say it and then translate. He says, Aj Jindar di Yaad Aagi. His childhood friend was Jinder. He says, you remind me of Jinder today. Look at the expression on his face. It's not my expression. Look at his expression. Right? And as I travel on the streets, I am amazed. People, he's, he's, uh, uh, this man just comes by and I'm standing by outside of Baba uh, Buleshah's place in Kasur and I'm walking down and he comes and he just lifts the petals and he showers it on me. So if we rise above, our divisions and our petty thinking and I always try to shy away from politics. I think humanity can take us forward. Uh, humanity can give uh, a, a way forward, can shine a light in this today's strained relationship of two nuclear powers and that's where I would like to end. Well, this was <coughs> as was to be expected. Excellent. Uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, one question that I'd like to ask, I mean, you concluded with uh, a very rich expression, very rich sentiment, but politicians don't work on the basis of sentiments. If you were to uh, meet with uh, the Prime Ministers of India and Pakistan and they were to ask you what is it we can do uh, so that your heritage is not completely lost what would you suggest? I think it's a we call it first and foremost keep one thing in mind I mean e there's no easy answer for this the ship has been sailing for seven decades and it's it's a heavy duty tanker right it ain't going to turn so fast it's going on full throttle uh, it's going on full throttle and, and, and to turn a ship like that it probably needs to be have needs planning and it will take a while to turn. So if I were to, was to claim that by my meeting the political heads and telling them open the borders, something's going to happen? No, I'm fooling myself. Uh, the past is past. Uh, I think where it starts from is my, the ray of hope that I see is the social media has opened up so much of humanity amongst us. Whatever the politicians may be doing, the reality is we are talking across the borders. Let's get that straight. We are talking more and more, and we are crying and we are sharing our emotions. The question is, can this become a can this this subcontinent have a day when the Berlin Wall came down? I have no I have no ability to see into the future, but I can tell you, in the social media, the Berlin Wall is falling. And that's all I can. Questions? Yes. Okay, just some comments on uh, minority rights in Pakistan. If you look at the, the creation of uh, Pakistan, I mean, firstly, uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this, but two nation theory is actually a Hindu concept. It was Veer Savakar who actually he, uh, came up with the idea, and it was, you know, by, by the Hindus actually an an antagonizing the Muslim community that, you know, so let I Let think you have to ask a question rather than. All right, sure, sure. Sorry, sorry. So, okay, uh, I just, I just wanted to say that. Okay, just, just, uh, I'll make this fast. All right, in, in on December 29, 1930, when uh, when Iqbal was the president of the All India Muslim League in, uh, in Allahabad, he did say that according to the teachings of the Quran, it is my duty to defend the places of, of worships of the of the uh, of the other religions if if, if need be. So that, that's on minority rights in Pakistan. All right, my my question for you is that um, you know, based on on your on on your observa on your observations and all that, you know, how how do you think that actually, um, I mean, how how do you think that you know your your culture your your heritage can be made more more accepted more more mainstream in Pakistan? So 
first and foremost, when you talked about the minority rights, I think let's let's not forget uh, Muslims also suffered in East Punjab. Their heritage is equally abandoned and equally forgotten, right? So it's a problem. Yes, a large section of Muslims re resides in India. I'm not I'm not denying that, and they are living as respectable citizens. But Punjab was bloodied, partitioned, and cleansed on both the sides, right? I seldom call this partition of India. I call it as partition of Punjab. If you look at it from that lens and start building it up, you will understand from a human perspective that the problem is far more bigger. Uh, your second part was about the, the, the Sikh community. What what we could do, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm at loss. I have stopped rationalizing anything because my community is in, a, is in a deep slumber. It's in a deep slumber about its existence that was in Pakistan. 80% of the empire once existed in the lands that became Pakistan. They don't emotionally connect with it. I'm glad this book has done very well. In about 20 months, it's gone to the fourth print run. It's doing well. But these are coffee table books. They're very small segments we're talking about. Majority of my community does not connect with it. As much as accessible as I've made it with 500 plus pictures, they don't connect with it. I've gone and appealed around the world. Pakistan government has an, has an, has an appetite. If we go with a proposal to adopt a monument, we pay through our pockets as a community. Sikh community is very generous, I tell you but generous in some, many times in the wrong ways, right? We have plastered and taken out and replastered gold on the Golden Temple many times. And I've gone and said that, you know what, can we adopt one monument in Pakistan? And I've got the monument, Mangat Gurdwara, which is lying in shambles right now. The beauty of that Mangat Gurdwara is nothing less than in terms of frescoes around, the, uh, like the Golden Temple's frescoes inside beautiful structure. The only reason why it's lying abandoned is because such structures have stopped existing in East Punjab, which is in India, because we've mar put marble and we put gold on them. We don't need others to destroy it. We've destroyed it ourselves, right? We Sikhs don't need others to destroy the heritage. We've destroyed it ourselves. We made it grander. You go to Amritsar, this time I went one year, about just about eight months back. I don't need to go to Disneyland anymore. <laughs> Because Golden Temple around, the periphery around it, because just in the precursor to the election, the Akali government went and plastered the whole thing with marble, uh, uh, the Pari Parisian uh, 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 statues, and I'm looking at them. This is Punjab, or am I in Paris? Do I need Paris in Punjab? So let's get it right. We are in a slumber. We, I have appealed, just to conclude that answer, I've appealed in many, I've spoken at 74 places around the world in my journey of this book, the last, uh, from Jan to August of last year. There has been a great reception for the subject, but I have again and again appealed that if we can mobilize funding and go to the Pakistan government and say, we want to adopt the Mangat Gurdwara, and it's been lying there only because the Sikhs have stopped existing there. And it's just time is acting on it. But can we revive that artisan, that Muslim artisan whom we used to engage to do the craft work, the, the frescoes inside the Golden Temple and many of our historical Gurdwaras, can we revive that art? And I've also proposed that Aga Khan Trust is probably a great place to start because they have the skills. They've been doing a lot for the Islamic, Islamic monuments, but there's not a single organization that's not at the head as yet. It's like here and here. So I, I don't have an answer. I have come down to a... Uh, only conclusion that some divine power is making me do this. I have no answer to this. I spoke in Islamabad Literature Festival and, and uh, I did use the same statement and one man, old gentleman came to me after, he says, uh, you take a lot of anchor in the divine. I said, because I can't explain. There's no rationality in this. Right? How is it happening? Why is it happening? I don't know. So I have to conclude this. Uh, there's some divine power that's making me work this. And, and the, in the span of two and a half years, I have now left 1,000 pages. 500 here, second book coming out, 1,000 pages. How it's happened so fast, I can't explain. These are PhD thesis, right, in their own rights. And I'm finishing two of them in two, two and a half years. But my job is to write, document, leave it for posterity. And I think if I've done that, that's what my role is. It ends there.
someone else wants to pick it up, wants to do it, I'm not going to waste my time. Right now. Sorry, I didn't want to follow up. No, I think uh, if they, yeah. um, I think it's a fascinating, uh, a fascinating story, and uh, I've had the, of course, privilege of speaking with you earlier on on this. I mean, you have uh, described it at community level, the pains of division, the pains of partition. At an individual level, uh, Sadat Hassan Manto has a has the story to Toba Take Singh, where where uh, where the individual, I think, ultimately goes mad. But this is not something that is absolutely unique to uh, to Punjab. Uh, it has Bengal. happened in other. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So, so this is what I was my, coming my, to. Sorry if I didn't bring that into the picture, but I, it was not intentional. <laughs> yes. No, no, it's all right. It's all right. But, but there is a, I'll also point to a difference between Bengal and Punjab. Bengal, the same thing happened. Exactly that line drawn across. In fact, dividing houses, dividing. Um, I myself come from a district called Silat, mm -hmm. which, as you know, yeah, yeah. like Punjab, came, uh, came to Pakistan through uh, a referendum. And and uh, and you know land property families were divided right across, but uh, to uh, continue I'm, on the lines of what Javed Bhai had had uh, hinted at, uh, I, I want to make two points. One is, uh, okay, you have these two massive projects, but I feel that it will need to have a thesis. I mean, you you said that you want to leave it to someone else to. Uh, uh, to uh, write the thesis, but if you have a compilation of this kind, 1,000 pages, you need to contain a single message. Now, if you are asked what this message is, uh, is it something in your head, and what would this message be? Uh, after this massive effort, there is something that you want to tell the world. Are you going to say that partitions are bad? Are, uh, or uh, or there should be different political uh, answers to uh, to communities that f feel different, etc. So, what would be the single thesis that you would like to uh, underscore? The only thing that I, I mean, I could. I'm not a politician. I'm not an academician, so I, I tend to think a bit differently. Um, the only thing that I would I, I've been telling people is don't forget your past, because past is a rear view mirror which allows you to look through the windscreen and drive in front to not make those mistakes that you once did or your forefathers once did. And that's the only message I want to leave. Because when you see a work like this and, and your eyes will tear, hopefully it will make you a bit better human being to say, you know what, before I react to something, I tell you I write very regularly on my Facebook and I write one, try and maintain one to one post a day or two days, right? And, and I write across the, I have a lot of people across the borders, right? But sometimes a radical will come without understanding what I'm trying to say, will react and say things which he's not understood. And I say, you know what, and I always tell them, please go back and read the post with a, with a calm mind as in totality, not in fragmented what you want to hear. So my point is simple that that's the only message I want to leave. Don't forget the past and help it let it navigate you into the future. I think that's a, it's a very powerful message. I just wonder whether when you have a great deal of history, you don't respect it. I live in a country which is very young in the United States, where anything that's about 20 years old becomes historical. And as you have vividly pointed out, both in your presentation and in your pictures and in your writing, there is so much history in our part of the world, but we are determined to destroy it. Yeah. Not, willi not deliberately, but just carelessly. Uh, if you go to uh, Mecca, I mean, what the Saudis have done to that mosque, it is incredible. Yeah. I mean, you were talking about the Golden Mosque. They have destroyed everything around uh, this uh, this mosque, paved it with uh, marble and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. There's a lovely picture you have in this book. It's the Mazar of Bullesha, yeah. marble. Mm -hmm. yeah. You go to Data Ganj Baksh, yeah. marble. So <laughs> somehow or other, uh, we people who have, a, I guess, more respect for heritage really need to give a very strong message to the people who are in decision-making positions that value your history because from your history learn, you learned lessons. Yeah. Anyhow, any other? Uh, 
Good evening, sir. I'm Sylvia from ISIS. Thank you for your presentation. Um, beside its uh, extreme uh, relevance from the historical and cultural point of view, I also appreciated your enthusiasm and your message, positive message of brotherhood and humanity. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the first one is about uh, the concept of nanakpantism that you have talked about. I understand that these believers uh, identify themselves as Sikhs, but are not identified by the others as such. So could you uh, further elaborate on that and I about the... That first and then I'll take your second one. I okay, one yes, time, please. Right? Um, I always say, before you point a finger, three point back at you, right? So I would not point to the others. First, I'll point to ourselves. Um, the Sikh faith, if you see, and, and I'll keep it very brief because it's a long answer to this and we can have a separate conversation, but the evolution of the Sikh faith from where it started, where Baba Nanak's uh, proclamation was na ko Hindu na Musliman. He says, neither are you a Hindu or neither are you a Muslim. Be a humane first, right? Over a period of time, as every faith and every philosophy develops, it forms, forms boundaries. And evolution of the Sikh faith, because of whatever happened geographically, uh, historically, resulted in the present form and the stuff by the, by the time of the 10th Guru, but we'll not get into that. But there was a time in the, in the early 1900s we ourselves, uh, in Punjab, there was a lot of violence happening in, uh, amongst the Sikhs. Their heads were being sought off in the early, in the, in the, in the, in the mid 1700s when the invasions were happening, right? A Sikh in this form could not live. So he was living in the jungles, right? But uh, they were doing more of guerrilla warfare to kind of push back the invaders. But when the Sikhs got the power, and once they actually formed themselves and they actually formed their identity, the first thing that they did was defined who a Sikh is. And that definition led to giving up many who were loosely bound to the faith, not because of the form, but because of the belief system. Because we, by defining who we are, we've got to keep in mind, we'll also have to let go of the others. And that's the biggest problem that happened, if that answers your question. It's a long answer to how it happened. I mean, I, I can't want to get into that right here. But I would say it's first us. Uh, so in India, uh, these Nanak Panthis in Pakistan who are existing, um, they would be definitely seen as Hindus out, outright. A Sikh will not accept them as a Sikh. And in Pakistan, when you go for seven decades, they are compartmentalized and they are they are living in small communities which have not had, a, a, you know, connects with the broader communities. It's a small community. They proudly say. If I get up in the morning and I do this Sikh prayer, in the afternoon I do this Sikh prayer, and I do this amount of charity giving and blah, 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 all the protocols, am I still not a Sikh? One person asked me this question. He says, why do you call me a Nanak Panthi? I said, no, I'm not calling you a Nanak Panthi. I had to clarify. I said, I say this because I want my community to get up and start thinking what have we done to ourselves. Thank I, you. I can have a separate conversation with okay, you later yeah. on if you want more details. <laughs> I hope you will. Thank you very much. Um, may I ask a second question? Yeah. Um, as I said, one of your very positive messages was that uh, of, of humanity. We are all human, and in the end, we are the same from one side and the other of the border. Um, I was very impressed by the sentence you, you have said, the words in which you have put it, uh, Punjab has been cleansed from one side and the other in the same way. And what indeed is happening nowadays, as you also mentioned, happens on one side and on the other of the border. Uh, while there is an issue with the preservation of the Sikh heritage in uh, Pakistan, there is also an issue with the uh, remembrance and the preservation of the Muslim heritage in in uh, Indian Punjab. In, in your last map, you have mentioned uh, Sarai Amanat Khan, mm -hmm. which is a place I have visited uh, okay. while I was traveling near Amritsar. And I was shocked in finding the Sarai uh, so beautiful with the inscription made by the, such a famous calligrapher like Amanat Khan, completely left to rot. Uh, earlier, Mr. Berkey asked you what you would you would you say to uh, the president of India and Pakistan if you could meet them. I think that uh, for sure um, a stronger engagement from uh, the governments, the institutions, is necessary. But on, but on the other hand, um, 
a long-term and effective preservation of heritage must be not only a top-down but also a bottom-up yeah. uh, process. For example, Seraya Manat Khan. Um, when I visited it, people were stealing bricks in order to build their own houses. Some who were probably too lazy to steal the bricks uh, just built their house using part of the walls that go around the Serai. And um, I think that therefore there is a strong issue with awareness. You also mentioned uh, that according to you, most of your community would not be really responsive to a book like yours. So I'm asking you, what do you think would be needed in order to produce, to raise awareness among normal people? I'm not talking okay. about governments, but I'm talking about people who live next to those gutvaras on one side of the border and people who live next to those ruins of mosques and serais on the other. Yeah, so before I answer that question, I would say if you've been to Sarai Amanat Khan, hop across to Pakistan, I'm sure the Pakistan ambassador is here, he can give you a visa, and go to Killa Jeevan Singh on the other side. Same story, same story. And Killa Jeevan Singh, uh, I, I sat in that Killa and I was looking, at it's a fort kind of a place, right? It's not literally a fort, but it's a village fort, right? And, uh, and I looked across to Sarai Amanat Khan, and it's a hilarious thing that the man who, who stays in there, he, I sat with him on his cot, it was a winter morning, and we had cups of tea, you know, and he walked me across, and, uh, and then he started telling me the stories. And he was a courier for many times, for many years, having crossed the border many times, <laughs> delivering things here and there. And his, his son, of course, uh, recently got shot at the border doing the same activity, right? So he was cursing the present Pakistani and the, and the, and the Indian governments for having made the border so, <laughs> so tight that we can't do our trade, right? But anyhow, what I'm getting to is, is that um, to your, your uh, other question from what we could do, See, it's, it's, I've, I'm, I've, I've said the, I've given the answer to that. It's so tough a journey. First and foremost, um, for a man like me, who's not in an academic institution, uh, who's given up his corporate career just because he feels very passionately about this, right? Uh, I have to be insane, first and foremost. Let's start with that. So you need insane people like me to first try and drive a change. I have given up two and a half years of my, my, my livelihood to simply do this because I feel so strongly about it. And it's not been an easy path. Uh, I don't know what lies ahead of, for me in the future, but I'm not embraced at this point of time by any organizations. I'm not having a salary check. I'm just doing it because I feel strongly about it. So when people like that start getting a passion about it, I think change will come. Now, I'm also not very optimistic. I'm not optimistic because policies are not driven by the people who are impacted by this tragedy. Policy, policies are driven by, by others who don't understand the problem, either in India or in the Pakistan. Right? And that's where I think if you see the East and the West, or sorry, the, 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 the Germany, the two, two parts of the Germany, which, where the wall also, was also brought down at some point of time, is the politicians and the, and, the, and the others at the higher level could not understand it. It's the common man who did something. So whether it will lead to a change, I don't know, but I, I feel feel strongly about it. And I feel, and I've said this in many of my seminars, I said, when is the day I, s I will see a, a, a Jain get up and say, I've got to reclaim my Jain legacy by writing it. I've got to reclaim the Hindu legacy by writing it. I've got to reclaim the Islamic legacy uh, in East Punjab by writing it. I think when we have pe mad people like, uh, like me going around doing this, uh, hopefully change can happen someday. I don't know. But I'm not very optimistic about it. Juventa? Thank you very much. Actually, I'd just like to come to Dr. Chaudhary's point again about having a thesis, which I think you actually have very strongly in your first slide about religion and philosophy, and that you said was the fundamental divide, which was the sort of beginning of all evils. And, and, and my, my proposition to you is that rather than just history, we need to reclaim our metaphysics. Mm -hmm. yeah because religion has overridden everything else mm -hmm. and we need to deconstruct religion and find the common ground and I hope you will take that further. So if you read my book, if you get a chance ever, there's a copy lying in the ISS library, it's, 
every word here and there is ingrained with exactly what you're trying to say. I'm not a historian. I'm not trying to teach people history. History is the most boring thing that my, it was the boring, most boring subject I was taught to me in, in school, right? I'm trying to teach you history in a different way. It's through my perceptions, my feelings, my emotions, my couplets, my, my, my sayings with cross faiths that I'm bringing in through. And I'm trying to tell you what I see today and connecting it to the past. And I think that's been the reason why the book has been successful in the small domain that it has been, that's gone to the fourth print in just about 18, 20, 20 months. Uh, it's doing very well, right? Uh, but uh, it's because of the humane approach. It's exactly the point you're saying. So if you try and read it, read a few chapters. You know, let's just pick up a few chapters. Read a chapter called Meeting Nuri. See the humane touch in that. I mean, it's not about history, but there are other chapters you read about history. But you know, there's a lot of such stories there, which is in, intertwining in this book. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Zainal Abidin here. Um, we heard about the marbles and the laws of heritage, but I really marvel at your presentation. Thank you. Um, my question is related to the earlier one about um, Sikhism and the partition. Uh, Forty years ago, I attended a talk in my school, in my class, and one of my classmates told me, he asked me this question, do you know why the Sikhs keep the five vows? Is that the five vows? Five the, symbols. I the would symbols, say. like the, the bangle, mm. the hair. Mm. Five symbols. Yeah. And uh, we don't, we didn't know. But he said, "Is this is a vow taken by the Sikhs that as long as the as long as the Muslims are in India, they will keep those symbols." So, do you do you really believe in that? No, that's my question. Mm -hmm. I want to know whether, in fact, it's true, whether it's true, and uh, I I couldn't believe it because the Sikhs friends which I know, mm -hmm. which I have, I don't see that in them. Uh, but and your presentation just proved to me. Uh, that in fact that cannot be true because you really came with a big heart and you came with a very the mind that I think says a lot about what we need today in this world so my question is to overcome this to bridge this divide this pain is secularism the answer so to answer that question first of all let me address it it's an intertwined answer I'll give but what your friend said let me start with that I'm not going to give you the explanation because that's not my objective, right? Simply, uh, it's the people with a little bit of less of this gray matter who tend to kind of think the way probably someone's trying to tell you. Let me put it this way. You know, I've, I've, in my part of my pr many presentations that I've given around the world, uh, I've been very careful with the choice of words that I deliver, right? Uh, the history in India and Pakistan is written this way. The uh, Isma Islamic India writes it, India's books will write, Islamic invasion of the Indian subcontinent. The Pakistani books will write, the advent of Islam. You see the choice of words, conquest versus advent. It gives you a very different flavor. Uh, the reality remains, Islam came into the Indian subcontinent not just by the invaders, it came by also the Sufi saints. And they brought in more of that thought. And there's, there's a beauty in it, right? The invaders, on the other hand, were whom were they fighting? They were fighting another, in, another ruler who was also a believer of Islamic faith. So was it that they were fighting an Islamic war? Or were they fighting for the powers? Now, when the Sikh power was getting formed in the early days, in the inception, when the five Ks came into, the five symbols came into the being, it was a tug of war against the, the, the narrow vision of the Mughal Empire. And the Sikhs make a mistake because the less, sometimes people have less of grey matter who interpret it. Mughal is not equal to Islam. The people of the Mughal Empire happen to be Islamic faith does not mean that they are Islamic rulers. Because they were Islamic rulers, they would not suppress the freedom of thought of another, another belief. So it is a tussle of power. And in that tussle of power, because the Sikhs went on a loggerhead for their own self-preservation and preservation of the other communities that were, the Hindu pundits were being, being, being on mass scale converted in, in Kashmir. When they went in and raised the voice against this inhuman act, it got perceived in the history as going against Islam. No. 
it was against the rule of mughal in fact a lot of islamic people in our history have helped the sikh gurus with that i'll i'll, I'll end so i think does that answer your question i, I mean we'll have sorry i knew at time we'll have yeah. to like so 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 secularism the way forward i mean i guess it's all about the mindset i mean that's what i was trying to say this the long the thing is it's all about the mindset it's the, make your gray matter a bit bit bigger to see things uh, that i'm trying to tell you in this in this presentation you know um, i was hearing a a clip today okay we know in india there's a lot of hue and cry happening about beef right nowadays we are hearing in today morning i heard about one video uh, one of the generals in of pakistan in karachi is saying that uh i'm a pakistani and i'm a muslim and i'm blah 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 on the on the on the 14th august and i'm and i was wondering where do the other minorities fit in this you could also say we are pakistanis and we are a bouquet of so many communities so when you start thinking that way you distort the whole secularism that's I how 1947 happened i think we'll take two more questions one here and one there and then we will hi um i can ask you things separately too amardeep but this is something that grew in my mind from your presentation today you know when you were talking about the fact that heritage is getting neglected yes there is that top down aspect to it but more importantly of course there aren't very many seeks left for whom these would have been um important structures even in terms of the monuments and i it's not a perfect comparison but i think of what happened to buddhist monuments in india it was the british that actually started excavating yeah. them because there were very few buddhists left in india you know by the time the british had come and even the mahabodhi temple was it was in use but people thought that the, all the statues there were hindu statues and there were you know hindu priests that were in charge of that temple until today mahabodhi temple is the most sacred place for buddhists anywhere in the world till today its administrative setup has five hindus sorry four hindus four buddhists and then the civil administrator of that district is the chairman of the council so um so of course i mean you know if you don't have a people that believe in those things for whom they have that emotional connect then the heritage to an extent is is going to be neglected so i i don't However, I, I, and i've said that in the presentation that it is actually a big complicated problem exactly so and i think i mean that you know that emotional connect aspect mm -hmm. that you talked about is extremely extremely important and in fact what we have in india today in terms of the buddhist monuments sarnath and all these places they've actually come up a lot of them with japanese or yeah. burmese or you know practicing buddhist countries as contributions or involvement sri lanka most of all But the other quick point that i would like to make here is you know you were talking of what's happened in east punjab i mean of course your subject is punjab today you're talking about punjab but actually this happens everywhere else i was even born after partition and i'm a kashmiri but my father knew punjabi very well and he actually really got on very well with punjabis and i actually when i think back to it i uh, i was born and raised in delhi and i saw delhi change delhi was considered a city of great culture and the language was hindustani which is a sort of closer to urdu than anything else and we reach a stage where you'd walk into a shop and people would talk to you in punjabi which delhi people did not consider that culture these were people who were refugees and it took me a while to understand that all punjabis are not refugees because those were the only people that i used to see in delhi yep. so you know delhi itself its food culture has undergone a change it's almost become like a punjabi city to many people that knew it as something very different because the people to whom that culture belonged about 30% of yep. delhi's people were muslims before partition so 1947 and changed the flavor of islam of delhi from islamic city into yes, a punjabi city yes i don't punjabi even say islamic so much no, but you know it had, you know, a, it had, it a, had a certain culture it, it has a certain language yeah, it had a huge culture of islam and, and, yes, and it, it just did. changed it vanished overnight yeah it did and so the language changed the food culture everything changed so there must be many cities like that on both sides of the border of you know even if you have muslims in delhi or whatever things still have changed i think i think we take one more and then we will Thank you. 
my name is Vijay Saluja. I am a senior fellow at the Institute of Social Sciences, New Delhi. Uh, my parents and ancestors all came from Pakistan, uh, and we uh, they were first working in Lahore and all this, and they were civil servants, and then we came to uh, uh, various places in Punjab and now in New Delhi. Uh, during the last 10 years, I had the chance of visiting Pakistan twice. Once to see the cricket match and the second time as a part of the Commonwealth delegation in Islamabad. And my first visit was in Lahore. My observation is this, that uh, I found the people over there extremely affectionate, lovable, and I felt more at home there because the language which they spoke were the language which my grandmother and people spoke at home. I mean, I could see because when I live in Delhi and you speak in Hindi, Punjabi, English and what not, but there it was only the Punjabi which we spoke at home. I mean, uh, the same dialect, the same way of talking and everything. And whenever we visited uh, to various friends uh, who, I mean, whom we came across during our uh, six days program at Islamabad. I mean, they were absolutely affectionate and I really feel that whatever things have been created between the two nations, to my mind, it is more of a political sort of a thing and both the people across, uh, I mean, this side or that side, they do not find any difference uh, between uh, the two people. So I really wonder, and this is a question to Mr. Amardeep uh, Singh Ji, that it's an excellent work which you have put in and done. But where do you go from here? Because, because uh, this, this should not stay as one of the uh, excellent uh, coffee book uh, in the libraries and uh, other uh, drawing rooms, but but where do we go from here? Because we know we know people, uh, the common man, both uh, sides of the country are not interested in all this thing, and uh, so so this is my question. And second, my um, because my uh, cousins, you know, who lived in Lahore in Ram Gali and other things, they were very. I mean, prosperous and doing good in business. So when I was visiting Lahore, my one of my cousin, who is very fond of uh, Lahore and his place, asked me, will you go to Ram Gali and find out what happened to our house? So I went to Ram Gali of Lahore, and uh, there was a Gurdwara uh, in their gali, uh, which I particularly uh, have visited, but that Gurdwara was not there it was converted into a mosque. So when I came back, when my cousin asked me, what happened? Is the Gurdwara still functioning? And I told him, no, there is a, the Gurdwara is not functioning. But uh, beside that, uh, I mean, I found the people, as I said, very affectionate. So this is my question to Mr. Barki and the High Commissioner, that, 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 that where do we go from here to make, create, bring back that affection need bond which exists in the people uh, here and there. That is my so uh, one can question. I, Thank can you. Can I just take a few pieces and I'll leave it to the two of you to actually conclude with that. Um, we talked about going to the Ram Gali, right? Let's not forget, across in Jalandhar, I can tell you a Gurdwara that was once a mosque. So I go back to the first slide, Roy Asivi and Roy Tusivio. We have cried on both the sides, okay? So let's not f let's not forget that it's a pain and it's a big problem, right? So, so uh, the second thing is love and affection. Of course, it's it's bountiful. One thousand pages, two books. How can it happen? It's not me who's doing it. I'm just an instrument of delivery. It's the love and affection of the people and the energies that are making me do this, right? So it is definitely they who are speaking through this work. It's not me speaking through it, right? I'm just delivering it. Um, where do we go? from here and you said you said about the emotions that you felt out there right i go back to that slide i showed you why did i go down to the kabul river and put my hand inside it it's the same emotion 
it's the emotion because my stories of Heer Ranja, Bhule Shah, or, or Soni Mahiwal, which my scriptures filled with, I cannot connect with it because the environment is snatched from it. The environment is what makes you breathe. If I'm thrown into the Gangetic belt and if I want to be told and forced now to think that my ancestral stories which belong to Jhelum and Indus now has to be refabricated and put into the Gangetic belt, boy, it's going to take me a while. It's the DNA that has to change, right? It's not about me. I've accepted it. But the stories will take, the DNA has to change from generations, right? So where do we go from here? I, I've said this time and again. I think it's a, it's the humanity that has to prevail, right? We have to, um, the, the walls have broken. I can tell you clearly, walls have broken in the social media. I can today, you tell me, you want, yesterday there was a lady who, who reached out to me, and that's, the, that's where I'll stop. There's a lady who reached out in a public forum, and that's the answer to this. And she says, our ancestors were from Peshawar. I am got a map which my dad drew by hand, and I am wanting someone to send me a picture of our ancestral house. I simply read that. I sent a message to her and to another person whom I know in Peshawar. By the evening, she had pictures of it. Walls have broken in the social media. People are coming together. Politicians can stay in their cocoons. They have to wake up one day. I think this is an excellent conclusion to a very interesting uh, discussion. My answer would be the same, the question that you were asking, that uh, it is because of social media that people have begun to see that there are human beings on both sides of the border. Uh, Diff and we are saying, uh, I live in the United States, and we are seeing this in the United States. See what's happened in Charlottesville, and see how the politicians are reacting to that, and what the people are saying. Uh, my view is that there's a lot of positive sentiment in Pakistan towards demolishing the walls. I once suggested uh, to the president of Pakistan, I said, do away with the visa regime. Let everybody go. And he said, well, my security forces will not let that happen. What happens if terrorists come? So I said to him, did the people who go to Mumbai get visas to get there? <laughs> so I mean, politicians will always find reasons for uh, doing it, because that's, that's their bread and butter. But I think people are becoming, at least on the Pakistani side of the border, I don't know whether the High Commissioner agrees with me, a lot of sentiment of working with uh, with India. Let me conclude. Thank you very much, yes, Amadeep. Uh, excellent presentation, okay, very good responses. I think we need to end. And, okay. <laughs> and there very small token of Thank our you. appreciation. Thank you. A subject.